Dear colleagues, uh, let's start our seminar. And today, Riham El Holi from Astronomy Department of Cairo University will present the talk on the study on, of antiprotons yield in hadronic collisions at NICA SPD detector. Please, Riham, start. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for taking the time today. Uh, so, my talk today is on the study of antiprotons yield in hadronic collisions at NICA SPD and how it can contribute to solving the problem of dark matter. So first, we're going to start by um, an introduction about dark matter and uh, different models of dark matter uh, and the search approaches uh, applied to try and find um, its identity. And we're going to focus about, uh, on astrophysical searches and how they relate to cosmic rays uh, and uncertainties surrounding uh, the observations. Uh, then we're going to explore the um, currently available data and what we can expect on the upcoming years. Then we'll revisit uh, our Monte Carlo studies from two years ago about how Nika SPT detector can contribute to the indirect detection of dark matter. And we will um, preview then our recent um, study uh, to, to um, confirm uh, our previous results using uh, the SPD root package, which is a software more specific to the SPD setup. So to start with dark matter, um, simply put, dark matter is a form of matter that does not interact electromagnetically. So we can't observe it uh, in the usual ways. And it is known to make up about 26% of the total energy budget of the universe, so more than five times uh, the ordinary matter contribution. And there are a lot of evidence on the existence of dark matter. Um, so here we're going to review three pieces of evidence, but there are a lot more. Uh, to start with, uh, first we, um, we look into spiral galaxies. Spiral galaxies uh, is one type of galaxies where uh, most of the mass is concentrated in a central nucleus of the galaxy and there are two spiral arms around this central mass. Um, so uh, this is how we expect the distribution of mass to be in a spiral galaxies. And according to this distribution, we can expect the rotational speed at each point of the galaxy based on its radial distance from the center. So the rotational speed we expect uh, from this mass distribution based on the balance of the curves, uh, sorry, the forces of gravity, is that the speed will increase linearly with the distance within the central nucleus of the galaxy and then starts to decline outside this uh, nucleus. Uh, this is what we predict. However, what we observe is that first, yes, it increases linearly within the nucleus, but then it plateaus outside this nucleus, which means that there is still an added contribution of mass that we don't know of and we can see. So if you want to look at this visually, it will be something like this. So in the, on the left, we see what we expect from Keplerian mechanics, and on the right, we see what we observe. Um, so again, this points at a missing mass contribution that we can't observe um, electromagnetically. And that's what we call dark matter. The second piece of evidence has to do with galaxy clusters. A galaxy cluster is simply a bound system of a conglomerate of galaxies. And we can um, use this system and the Virial theorem to calculate the gravitational mass of a galaxy cluster. And on the other hand, we can use the luminosity of each of these galaxies to estimate uh, a luminous mass as well. And ideally, both of these values should be close to, its, to each other. However, what we found is that the gravitational mass of each galaxy cluster is much larger than its luminous mass. So this also points at a missing mass contribution we don't know of. And the breakdown of the components of a galaxy cluster is 
such as 1% only is made up of galaxies, what we can observe optically, and there is also 9% X-ray emitting gas that also we can observe electromagnetically. However, the rest 90% we can't account for, and that's what um, dark matter makes. The third piece of evidence has to do with um, a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing, and it's a direct consequence of the bending of light predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, there are several types of gravitational lensing. Here we see how strong gravitational lensing works, where um, an object works as a lens between an observer and the background source, where it bends the light coming from this source and creates um, deformed images on the background of the same source, and they are usually called Einstein rings. And how this relates to dark matter is that sometimes um, gravitational lensing effects are observed where there is no um, dark, there is no uh, object to cause it. So that's what uh, astronomers usually call dark lenses. And uh, they hypothesize that there is an object that is causing this gravitational effect, but we cannot see. This phenomena is, has actually been utilized to observe what astronomers call the smoking gun of um, dark matter, which was a collision between two galaxy clusters. An event is called the Pollet Cluster. Um, and during this event, astronomers were able to observe how each of the three components of uh, the clusters behave. So first, we observed using optical observations, the galaxies, how they behaved. So they are bound system that were gravitationally slowed down by the collision. However, they weren't much affected um, else how. Uh, the second component, which is shown here in pink, is the X-ray emitting gas, which was slowed down substantially because it, it's also affected by the electromagnetic interaction. And the third um, component, which is supposedly dark matter, shown here in blue, were reconstructed uh, using this gravitational um, lensing phenomena to see how it interacts during the collision and what was found that it bypassed the collision entirely without being affected by the collision. So that's how sci scientists came to expect dark matter to be weakly interacting. And there are a lot of models and candidates for dark matter. Um, and consequently, there has been a lot of ways to classify these candidates. So some of these classifications are based on production mechanism. So whether it was produced thermally during the early stages of the universe in the Big Bang nucleosynthesis or non-thermal, uh, for example, gravitationally due to the expansion of the universe. It could have, there's also another classification based on particle, particle nature, which is to say whether it is a baryonic candidate expected to be to obey the standard model, or it's non-paryonic yet to be known and unidentified. Another way to classify is based on their mass range, and usually candidates of low mass are classified as hot dark matter and have relativistic speeds, and heavy uh, candidates are cold dark matter with non-relativistic speeds. So the most, the most favored candidates are WIMS, uh, which is an acronym for weakly interacting massive particles, and it's actually the most favor of these candidates, followed by matches, which aren't exactly particles, but kinds of astronomical objects. Uh, then stride neutrinos, which are right-handed singlets, and um, supersymmetry particles like the Venus and Hexenus, and axions, and finally, Kaluza klein candidates, which are related to extra-dimensional uh, models. So we're going to look more closely at the WIMPs as they are more concerned with what we are going to explore today. So the WIMP is believed to be produced thermally during the early stages of the universe and to be of non-baryonic nature, so we can't identify its, uh, its nature yet, and uh, to be called dark matter because it has a heavy mass. So its mass range is supposed to be or expected to be from 10 GEFs to 10 TEFs. And uh, it's also hypothesized to interact um, with 
ordinary matter nuclei through elastic scattering. And the recoil energy of this scattering is expected to range from 1 to 100 keVs. Um, another hypothesis about the points are that the pair annihilate and decay to produce standard models as final uh, standard model particles as final products. So this, in summary, is um, what we expect of WIMP's behavior. Now there are a lot of search approaches uh, utilized here and we can classify them in three categories. Uh, the first one is the indirect detection, uh, which is based on the idea that two dark matter particles interact and can produce standard matter particles. And the second approach is direct detection of dark matter and it is based on the idea that dark, a dark matter particle can elastically scatter over standard matter particle and that we can measure this um, scattering and the third approach is carried out in colliders, and it is based on the hypothesis that standard matter particles can bear produce uh, dark matter particles, either directly or through uh, a mediator. So we're going to explore these um, search approaches from last to first. Uh, in colliders, usually uh, the utilized approach is the missing transverse momenta, uh, where we try to find um, if there is a signal of invisible matter, but we cannot say that it is dark matter. That's why all the search approaches need to complement each other and it's not enough to only use one approach. And some of the experiments using this approach to uh, pursue dark matter particles are Atlas and CMS. Now for direct detection, it usually focuses on um, amplification of the recoil signal from a dark matter particle scattering of an ordinary nuclei. And this is carried out using heat, ionization, or scintillation. And the recoil energy is usually so small, like tens of keVs. That's why the minimization and identification of background signal is crucial for this type of experiment. And they're usually carried out deep underground um, in well-studied areas. And using several uh, experiments result, these constraints are combined to constrain further the dark matter um, particle mass and its cross-section of interaction with um, the ordinary matter. Uh, the third search approach is the indirect detection of dark matter, which uh, is expected to find its signal in the cosmic ray spectrum uh, where we can see a distortion in the usual spectrum of cosmic rays uh, with the increasing um, accuracy of measurement. So this is because we believe that uh, when spare annihilate and decay to produce standard model particles, and these particles we can uh, detect as incoming flux, uh, which would look like a bump in the usual uh, spectrum of cosmic rays. So these are the targeted products. Usually, uh, they are either neutrinos and photons or um, anti-matter. There are a lot of experiments. Um, previous experiments usually were ground-based and satellite uh, airborne, and they focused on photon detections. Uh, however, recently, there has been two experiments that focused on anti-particles, which are the Pamela and AMS. And they were able to constrain different channels of annihilation to um, narrow the mass range we expect. And there is also another set of constraints for uh, the decay channels. So we would look more closely at the results of these two experiments. First of them is the Pamela Magnetic Spectrometer, which operated for 10 years from 2006 to 2016, and measured the fluxes of uh, primary cosmic rays, anti-particles um, especially, and it, it had a time flight system and an anti-coincidence system and a calorimeter. And the results were covered the anti-protons especially from 18 MIFs to 190 GIFs kinetic energy, and this compared to previous experiments, as we see here, is 
much more accurate. These results only cover data taken from 2006 to 2009, and we can view the same uh, results in terms of anti-proton to proton ratio, and we can see that it increases consistently and kind of plateaus at a kinetic energy of 10 gibs. There were a, re a reanalysis of this data and an extension of the energy range to include antiprotons with energies from 60 nits to 350 gibs. Uh, this is for the Panda uh, results. The second experiment, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, or AMS for short, uh, is currently in operation still and started operating in 2011, and it measured all the charged, charged cosmic ray flux, not only uh, antiparticles, and it has a time flight system as well, and the tracking system, and rich detector, and an ECAL. And it covered antiprotons from uh, kinetic energies, for, sorry, from momenta from 1 to 450 gifs. And here uh, the results are viewed in terms of rigidity, which is simply the momentum divided by uh, the charge. So, for example, if we have an antiproton with one gif momenta, it would have a rigidity of minus one gigavolt. That's why here they take the absolute value. And these same results can also be viewed in terms of antiproton to proton ratio. And we can see here that even compared to the Pamela results, which were already more accurate than previous experiment, the accuracy is much higher, which is actually less than a few percent. So what can we do with this signal? Uh, we first need to exclude any other sources of uh, secondary cosmic rays to be able to pinpoint if there is actually an exotic signal that is not uh, readily apparent in this measurement. So what the most important secondary, um, secondary source of antiprotons is the collisions between cosmic rays and uh, interstellar medium. So this dependence on, depends on the abundance of each of the nuclei in the cosmic rays and interstellar medium, and these are the relative abundance uh, average over the spectrum. And we can see here that proton, uh, proton and deuteron are the most abundant in cosmic rays. So based on these abundances, we can then calculate the contribution from each channel of collision between each combination of these nuclei to the final yield of secondary antiprotons. So we expect that channels to be most significant is the proton-proton and proton-helium channels, followed by the proton-deuteron. And we can see here the expected uh, relative contributions. So first, we need to exclude the signals from the AMS signal. However, there's a lot of uncertainties surrounding the signal, and here they are viewed totally, and there are four sources. We, we are going to review each of them from the least significant to the most significant. So the least significant of them is the primary spectral slopes, which is simply um, the abundance of protons and helium in the cosmic rays, and it was believed to be uh, known accurately. However, the same AMS results known recently have found that they change behavior at a certain energy, so we can no longer be sure at these energies how um, the spectrum is expected to behave, and the measurements are still not uh, in high accuracy at this energy range. So this uh, source of uncertainty affects the spectrum, especially at high energies only. The second uh, source of uncertainty is, it has to do with the galactic environment and the propagation parameters uh, in terms of diffusion and convection. And there are several models of these parameters. However, uh, they vary quite a bit. 
and they they're also more significant in higher energies because the longer uh, the higher energy particles travel more in the galactic environment and are more affected by by these parameters the third source of uncertainty has to do with the time of observation in terms of the solar activities in um, when the observation is taken so uh, on this however affects uh, low energy particles more because the lower the energy of the particle, the more it is affected by the energy of the solar wind. And there are some um, models of it as well, but still uh, there is a range of uncertainty. The most significant source of uncertainty, however, is the production cross-section um, in terms that we, we don't know uh, the cross-section of production of antiprotons in of each of these collision channels, there's only parameterizations, but there is no um, observational um, data that can conclusively pinpoint this cross-section. And we can see here that the uncertainty can range from 20 to 50% based on the energy. And these parameterizations have been utilized in the past. However, uh, we can see here that even though they are in good agreement for antiprotons above 10 GIFs and um, coll colliding protons of a few hundred GIFs, there is uh, quite a deviation for antiprotons below a few GIFs. So what we have currently in terms of data uh, for each channel, first for the proton-proton channel, uh, we only have these data sets and we can notice here that they are all, uh, most of them is uh, from before 1980. And here they are given in terms of the radial scaling, which is simply the energy of the antiproton um, by the energy, the maximum energy the antiproton can have in terms of the center of mass energy of the collision. And this can be viewed um, as in graphically in this form in both frames and we can see here that on the right we can see that high transverse um, momenta measurements are scarce when the radial scaling is low which it can, some, it's something can that can be treated by the SPD more on that later and the other channels um, the data set we have so far is from the LHC uh, experiment, and it was released only two years ago. Uh, it was a proton uh, helium data. And for all the other channels, we don't have any data sets. In addition to this, even in the proton proton channels, there is no feed down for the hyperion decays to antiprotons, the secondary antiprotons, which would make the already scarce data inconsistent. As we can see here, the anti-lambda to anti-proton ratio in the collision affects the cross-section of anti-proton production and it's not accurately determined as well. So during the last few years after the release of the AMS measurements, um, a lot of researchers have been drawing attention to the need to cover a phase space of cross sections of antiproton production to be able to come to a more coherent conclusion about the signal in the AMS measurements. And this here is what we expect to, to the requirement to catch up to the accuracy of AMS. So here, um, this phase space needs to be covered with a 3% accuracy within the contours and a 30% outside of it. And experiments has already started to take notice uh, of this requirement and several experiments are planning to conduct measurements. So we expect the LHC to continue its measurements from proton helium. However, we expect the energies to be even uh, higher than the last one, which was at the center of mass energy of 114 GIFs. And the compass collaboration as well has, has plans to, con to start 
taking fixed target measurements of proton-proton and proton-helium collisions uh, in the next stage at energies ranging from 9 to 20 gems. Now we can look at uh, the Nika SPT and what we can expect uh, it can contribute to uh, these measurements. So as you all know, the nucleotron-based ion collider facility, uh, Nika, right now is being constructed at uh, GEN, and it will feed two experiments, the MPD, multi-physics detector, which is going to study the properties of dense bionic matter in heavy ion collisions, and spin physics detector, concerned with spin physics studies. It's expected to have uh, to use polarized protons and neutrons, and maybe in the next stage, uh, helium-3 ions as well. And um, there, we could utilize any combination of these beams uh, in form of a collision. And expected kinetic energies for the beams are for protons from 5 to 12.6 shifts and for neutrons from 4 to 11.8 shifts. And expected luminosity at the highest energy uh, could reach 10 to the power 32 for proton-proton collisions. So as for, as for the SPD, um, uh, viewed his, here is one of the geometries currently under consideration for the detector. However, the main parts of uh, the detector is the sa are the same. So we expect to have a magnetic system which would have uh, several con uh, configurations from solenoid, toroid, and a hybrid of both configurations. In addition to a vertex detector, a tracking system, an electrocalorimeter for photons and electrons and positrons, and a range system for muons and uh, hadrons, and a time flight, time flight system for particle identification, luminosity monitors, and local polarimetry for angular uh, measurements. Now, two years ago, we wanted to see uh, what, uh, how much of a contribution the SPT can make to um, defining the signal of AMS. And we started by, uh, by using PFIA to simulate uh, the events with um, the limitation and, and uh, capabilities we expect of the SPT. So we started by measuring the expected cross-section of antiproton production at the highest energy, and we found it to be around 33 millibar, which would be accessible given the luminosity of the Nika collider. We also found that about 95% of these produced antiprotons would be through the decay of antihyperons, namely anti-lambdas and anti-sigmas. We also wanted to, to found the coverage of the SPT based on some cuts we applied of, from our expectations of uh, the limitation of the detector. And we found, as, as you can see, that um, the SPD can cover a significant part of the phase space required to come to a conclusion about uh, the AMS signal. We then wanted to see whether um, the energy range of the produced antiproton was accessible to the SPT, and we found that most of the antiprotons have momenta less than 5 GeV, which we expect could be measured at the detector, as well as a separation capability of antikines and antiprotons that reached 5 uh, GeV momenta, given that the time of flight resolution is less than 60 picoseconds. Then we wanted to look at the angular distribution of the produced antiprotons, and we found that, in fact, the far pi angular acceptance of the SPD is going to give an advantage in, in terms of maximizing, maximizing the kinetic range that the SPD detector can cover um, compared to fixed target experiments, for example. Now, uh, in this study, we wanted to to find, uh, revisit these findings, but using a tool more specific to uh, the SPD detector setup. 
So we utilized the toolkit of SPD root, which is a fair root based uh, code uh, designed to simulate the SPD detectors and reconstruction. And that can also be used for data analysis of the simulated events. It utilizes C++ and uses the root and virtual Monte Carlo libraries as well. And it can be found publicly in this uh, Git repository. So here is the dependency tree of the SPD root. And it is fairly the same as fair root, uh, in addition to some classes specific to the SPD root setup and geometries. And it also offers the option of um, event visualization. Of course, none of these geometries is the final geometry yet. However, uh, the geometries in the SPD root can be customized. So using the SPD root, we wanted to revisit our previous result. Uh, first, starting by the coverage of uh, the kinematic range. And we found that our previous result still holds to a large extent and that the contribution the SPD root can make to cover this kinematic range is still quite large. We also wanted to see if the SPD root can contribute to uh, minimizing the uncertainty with the anti-lambda to anti-proton ratios, uh, which is currently at, uh, at around 12%. And we found that there is a SPD detector can contribute in the energy range accessible, and we'll revisit this later as well. So secondly, we wanted to see if the produced antiproton can in fact be reconstructed using the SPD route, and we found that uh, from momenta for antiproton ranging from 0.5 to 4.5 GIFs, about 85 to 95% of produced antiprotons are in fact detectable in the inner part of the SPD. Then we wanted to look into particle identification and the possibility of separating antikines from antiprotons. So first we wanted to see if we can reconstruct the event time. So we utilized an algorithm used by the Alice collaboration um, where we minimize the value of chi squared uh, based on iterating through the mass, mass combinations for each of the tracks uh, in the event with three math hypotheses, which are pions, kinds, and protons. And with each of these mass combinations, we calculate the time of event and calculate the value of chi squared, and we pick the mass combination that minimizes this value. We excluded um, events with track multiplicity less than or equal to three because we don't expect to produce antiprotons with, with, with these events. And we assume the time of flight resolution to be around 70 picoseconds and the resolution of the transverse momenta to be around 2%. And we found actually that the reconstruction event time resolution can reach from 40 to 55 picoseconds given these uh, limitations. Using the reconstructed event time from this algorithm, we then reconstructed the masses of uh, the particles in question, and we found that up to a momentum of around 3.5, we can separate antikines from antibionts with a purity of around 99%. Then we wanted to revisit the possible contribution SPD can make to minimizing the uncertainty in the high prone uh, decays. So we looked into uh, the ratio of high prones that decay within the inner part of the detector to see if we can reconstruct these decays. And we found that around 93% of all anti and almost all of anti signals uh, at the energy of 26 ships, in fact, decay within the inner part of the SPD. So, we reconstructed these masses. Uh, first, the, the anti-lambda mass was reconstructed using 
uh, the decay tracks uh, with a resolution of around two nips, which can fully be explained by the momentum resolution, whereas the uh, anti-sigma was defined by a resolution of 19 nips, which uh, is mostly because of the energy resolution of the electromagnetic calorimeter uh, due to the photon, two photon tracks as the final product of the neutral point in this decay channel. So, what we can expect of uh, the STD in order to be able to deliver these results are the promised four angular distribution, uh, sorry, acceptance, to maximize the kinematic range we can cover, and a time, a time of flight resolution less than or equal to 70 picoseconds to uh, achieve the particle identification accurately for um, this momentum range, and the ability to reconstruct secondary vertices if we were to contribute to investigation of hyperin decay. And a precision luminosity monitors with accuracy of up to 97% if we were to accurately evaluate the cross-section of antiproton production, which is the desired measurement. And lastly, here is what we conclude from the previous two studies. We uh, expect that we can cover uh, the range up to 3.5 momenta uh, to separate antikines and antiprotons with a purity of around 99%, given that the time of flight system has a resolution of around 70 picoseconds, and given that also we can reconstruct the event time with, as, uh, with a resolution ranging from 40 to 50 picoseconds. And we also expect to be able to use the tracking system and the ECAL of the SPD to reconstruct the hyperons decay, uh, which represents a primary source of secondary antiprotons, given that um, re identification of secondary vertices are possible. We also hope to be able to extend these measurements to include more nuclei uh, with the inclusion of these beams at the NECA collider. And finally, if we were to take one conclusion is that the SPD detector uh, can make a sizable contribution for the search of physics beyond uh, standard model in terms of the indirect detection of dark matter. Thank you. Please proceed with any questions. Okay, thank you, Riham. Very nice thank talk. You. I have one question for you. Yes. Is, uh, is uh, particle polarization really important in your study? I uh, know. We don't believe so, at least. Uh, so, you, actually, you don't care about polarization, yeah? No, I don't think it, it would make much difference. Okay. Please, questions. Oh, I have comment concerning your question. Uh, so at the moment, yeah, we, we know nothing about polarization of cosmic rays, uh, mm -hmm. space, protons in space. But in principle, uh, for longitudinal polarization, the total cross section for different uh, proton polarizations are a bit different. So maybe for future it will be important. So fortunately, we have possibility to measure. Uh, Antiproton yield as a function of polarization. Yes, so in terms of the current observations of AMS, polarization is not um, so significant. However, it can be in the future. So that's what you mean? I think uh, actually it's important to think about polarization because yes. SPD is a detector which uh, has a polarization. Uh, main feature, right? And to prove, mm -hmm. to prove, uh, to use uh, this study, I think it's better to uh, somehow to think about polarization and how it can be used, and maybe uh, to do some simulation on this topic. 
Okay. Okay. How about questions, please? No questions. Okay, very nice talk. Uh, thank you again, Rihan. Thank you. And success in your work, in your future work. And thank you. Thank you, everybody, for seminar. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.